especially since the church <clears throat> has turned 12 plus and as we start into a new season, I have been, good southern word here, I've been, I've been pondering, um, been pondering our, our purpose, um, reflecting back where that came from, what it was, and I remember the time, it's about 13 or so years ago, when I felt the Lord was really encouraging us and, and kicking us out, if you will, of, of where our, our current comfort laid and was moving to a city we had never even visited. Um, I, had, I was reading this book that many of you might know. It's an older book now. Jim Collins wrote it called Good to Great. It was a, it's, it was a business book. And he had got my attention on a couple things. One was what he called a BHAG, and that was a big, hairy, audacious goal. And it came along around the same time where I was being challenged by some, some older people in my life, um, older in the faith I've looked up to, really prodding about why a new church. You know, what, why a new church? Why a new church? You're really kind of getting me down to the brass tacks. And, and I really believe it was some of, some of Collins' work, this idea of, of what, what can you be the best at and, and to pay attention to that. And I, and I guess it was just this whole con, con, convulgence of material that was working in me. And when I finally got asked that one last time, I said, that we want to be a church, I want to be a church that develops the most spiritually influential people on the planet. And that's what came out of my mouth. Now, that's a, probably, that's a, that's a big, hairy, audacious goal. How, how do you go about developing a church that the people are the most spiritually influential on the planet. I had finished my doctoral project, and my doctoral project all was around this main, these two main questions. Why aren't more people involved in evangelism, and why aren't they any better at it? And it was in that context, all of these streams coming together, that I come to the conclusion that there are, there are three characteristics of someone that brings to bear spiritual impact in their sphere of influence. Now, around here, we label them in code, if you will, just sticky statements, fresh starts, great friends, and real purpose. And, and how they connect to us is that if we, if we, they're fresh starts, not fresh stops. So if we have an ongoing relationship with Christ... That continually transforms us. You understand that when we come to Christ for the first time, there is a transformation that's taken place in our life. We're not the same person. But then there's a continual transformation that takes place. And that, that, that's, that's the freshness that I'm referring to. And that to have spiritual influence in a culture that can smell stale and plastic and fake a mile away it has to be something that's fresh and ongoing in our life. The second relates around community. We, Pastor Craig talked about our life groups that are beginning up. It's just an entry point, if you will, to what it means to be shaped in community, that God brings us together, not just as a collection of individuals, but as a group of individuals that come together and we, shape, we help shape one another. Your life experience helps shapes me. My life experience helps shape you. Your faith helps to shape my faith. My faith helps to shape your faith. We grow together. We grow together in, in community. And then the last one, this idea of real purpose. I said this a lot. This is my phrase. Most people long for a purpose, but they settle for a cause. Causes are temporary. Causes generally are culturally or societal driven, but a purpose is something that's long-lasting, deep inside, that never goes away, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about that, kind of that purpose, but how do you make spiritually influential people? So as, although this, this, the vision for Gateway doesn't change, and I am as sold on it as I've always been and ever been. Churches come across seasons. We hit seasons, and I believe we're in a season. We're about to enter a new season. Now, this new season isn't this idea just of, well, there's going to be a building, and then the season is that there's a building. The season is what's driven the cause for the building. That the Lord is preparing us, and, and so many of us have sacrificed for this, believing that the Lord is preparing us for more. And that's the season. How do you get prepared for more. And so in that, 
I believe God directed me to four different things that we should be highly focused on coming into this new season. Okay? Here they are. Evangelism synergy. Leadership expansion. Discipleship tenacity. And advancing prayer. That in our new season, coming into our new season, these are the things God wants us to pay attention to as a body. The first one I want to talk about today is this idea of evangelism synergy. So Pastor Craig's going to help me do this real quick. I've got a couple questions I want to ask. These are not rhetorical. You know, you're so funny. 11 o'clock. It's just so funny. These, so I want you to answer. The first question is, I want you to name, name someone who was uh, instrumental in you coming to faith and or kind of a, a, a faith um, uh, kind of formation kind of thing in your life, okay? So I want you to name someone that was instrumental in, for you coming to faith and or you being transformed, all right? So just, we're just looking for names. And just raise your hand, and Pastor Craig and I are going to run around and get, get these names on the microphone. Who's going to be first? There we go. Pastor Rick Gaylor, my youth pastor. Okay. Robin? Chanel. <laughs> Way to go, Dad. Rhonda Fields, my pastor on campus. Rhonda Fields. Mom, you guys came to faith on your own? Claude Schooley, my grandpa. All right. My mother-in-law, Elsie Kruger. Elsie Kruger. Miss Vera Peary, she was my grandma. Camp DeSoto, my childhood camp. All right. Come back here. How are you? My wife, Lenore. Nikki Peterson. All right. Anyone else? Come on, just get the opportunity to give them a shout out. All right, here, here we go. You know, they're watching. We, we alerted all of them. They're watching online. Uh, Sister Bertha, my Sunday school teacher. Sister Bertha. You remember the, I remember those days. I'm a brother and sister. Anybody else? You want to give a shout out to someone who was transformation? My husband, Joel. Say it again. I was talking. My husband, Joel. Husband, Joel. All right. Most of us can trace our faith. And, and, and many times, I don't know, I grew up in a tradition that, you know, I, I can remember the day, the, first, the day that I first prayed to receive Christ. But many people can't. But why? Because it's, it's, it's been, it was a process in your life. It was a set of dominoes that kind of fell. And then you realize, wait a minute, I'm not the same person I was. And generally speaking, you're going to be able to track that back to somebody, some, some person in that process. All right, second question. No church answers. If I get church answers, I'll take the microphone away from you, right? It's like the old Sunday school class, you know, what's, what's brown and furry and, and collects nuts? And the kid says, sounds like a squirrel, but it's got to be Jesus, right? So <clears throat> what are your first feelings, words about evangelism? Feelings or words around evangelism? It's not for me. It's not for me. Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. If, if, if those would be your sentiments, either of those two, raise your hand. Okay. Anybody else? Other words conjures up around evangelism. I'm not sure how to do it. Not sure how to do it. One of, the words that, one of the words that would come to me would be program. And it, it's because of, of the era that I grew up where evangelism was, um, it was program dri driven. It was, um, I remember being on a group in college and we were, we were trained in something called evangelism explosion. And it was like four questions and you go door to door and you ask people, and I'm not a door to door guy, but you know, I did it and I remember getting to a door and I asked the first question. You know, if, if you were to die today and, and was in heaven, what reason would you give to Jesus to let you in? Isn't that a great introduction question? Hi, I just showed up at your door, and I want to know what you're going to do when you die, right? I mean, so, and I remember the first house I went to, the person said, well, I don't believe in God. 
And I looked at my list and I went, well, that covers the next three questions. Really great to meet you. And then um, went to the next door. But recently there was a, a, a survey, um, uh, a study uh, that was started by Alpha. And, you know, I teach a course called Alpha here, um, 10-week introduction to the Christian faith. And it's, a, it's an unbelievable course. I'll teach it again September 11th. It's one of the groups. And they uh, commissioned a study that Barna did. Um, around this idea um, of faith and evangelism and stuff. And I wanted Pastor Craig to kind of give you a quick little uh, intro into that. So the study was of millennials. The millennials are like people who are 20 to 35. Where are my millennials at? Yeah, best generation in the house. Um, so the, it was a study of millennials. They asked the question, what do they think of evangelism? And almost 50% said that they believed that evangelism was wrong. Not that they were had a version to it, but that was straight up wrong. Um, and so... You know, obviously, that's not a good thing. Um, and so you asked the thoughts, like, why? Yeah, I mean, what, where do you think that's coming from? Yeah, I think part of it is to the, that programmatic side of it. And our generation is kind of seen as negative to go to someone and tell them you're wrong and I'm right. There's questioning of anybody who says, I have the truth or, or you can tell me what I should do or shouldn't do. That's um, not loving. Um, that's not understanding of their viewpoint and their worldview. And so I think part of it is just the, the mode of evangelism. Because another part of the study was that over 90% of millennials still believe that a relationship with Jesus is the most important thing that anybody could have and desire that for people. So there's a disconnect between that desire and evangelism. Yeah, and, and so that's the, that's the gap I want to try to close today. One of the interesting things that the study revealed was that a, a millennial and, and the, of the ones that they had you know, interviewed was four times more likely to have someone in their life that wasn't a believer. So actually, you said they, they averaged like four people in their sphere, not, not just someone they know, but four people that did not have any kind of connection to Christ, where outside of the millennial generation, it's down to one, down to one. And so... The, the good news, the good, the, the good news about the study, right, that there are plenty, there are plenty of folks that, that need the gospel, whether they know that thing or yet not. The bad news, of course, is the cultural context, that there is a lot of pushback culturally over it, all right? But here's the better news. My experience has been that the culture, the cultural pushback gets eliminated and eroded when there is a relationship and where there is a need. Okay? So if I'm having a conversation with you about something, culture impl- impacts my conversation with you on a global scale, but on a personal scale, it all gets kind of thrown out the window. So just a little example. Just, just this, just this uh, was a couple days ago. I had an encounter with one of my neighbors. Um, and our encounters haven't been the best encounters over, over the course of the last couple years. Um, I know no one else has neighbors like that. I'm, I'm that neighbor. Um, and yet, really, he's an older gentleman, um, retired professional, um, highly intelligent. Um, but he, him and his wife love dogs. And they rescue dogs and they love dogs. And my wife and daughter love dogs. I tolerate dogs. They love dogs. And, you know, a couple years ago, we lost our 15-year-old beagle that died, right? So, so there, that helped me understand a little bit more love of dogs. When you lose a dog, it's been around 15 years. So anyway, one of the rescue dogs had died suddenly. And here was this gentleman, this hardened gentleman in my driveway. And you can tell he's, he's moved by this. He's, he, he came to tell us this. Well, immediately I felt in my, in my gut, in my spirit, however you want to define it, that I should pray for him. And the more that I felt like I should pray for him, the further I backed away from him. It was like the closer I got to my garage door. I'm like, I remembered our last encounter of substance. And it was challenging. And and just as I would get myself kind of in the place where I could pray for him, I really felt like the Spirit said to actually touch him when I pray. Now, we don't touch people, right? Right? I mean, even in church, so you can, it's, funny, it's fun, funny to try to find someone's personal space in church. Y'all have it. And I try to find it on some of you because it's funny. The closer I get, the further, the further you, the, you are the people I want to hug. All right? So couldn't avoid it. Stepped in and said, hey, 
can Jean and I pray for you? And I mean, water works immediately. When we went to place our hand on his shoulder, he reached his arms out to be touched. And we prayed. Now, some of you, hopefully at the end of this message, you'll understand that that still is evangelism. But the culture, and I know his, I know his mindset, I, I know his intellect, I know what he's already concluded around certain things and how he got there. All of that went away in the middle of a need, and we had at least a proximity kind of a relationship. It's ironic to me that the activity of evangelism is being, the, the activity of evangelism isn't being rejected by our culture. The object of our evangelism is. Okay? Evangelism is not being rejected. How do I know that? July's issue of Fortune magazine. Here is the article that I read. Can these salad evangelists persuade America to finally eat its vegetables? And it's like a four or five page article. I mean, it is, it is down in the, in the nitty-gritty of, of sustainable farming and getting the food to local resource restaurants. I mean, and these entrepreneur, three entrepreneurs, they are, I mean, you would have thought that they just invented water, okay? The way that the article is talking about them, right? Salad evangelists. Ev evangelism isn't the issue. You know, in Silicon Valley, there are actually chief evangelist officers, that, that evangelists are even appearing in the C-suites of our corporations. Evangelism, being excited about something is not the problem. The problem ends up coming in about who we're excited about. I, I am, I'm like, I'm weird. I'm like an introvert. I, I, when I take the Myers-Briggs and all that stuff, I land on either side of the introvert-extrovert ext scale. You might just say, well, he's an extrovert because I stand up here. I'm, I'm not. I, I kind of go back and forth. But you know what? There's, there's another thing I talk a lot about, restaurants. Like, I'm not a foodie. I, I, don't, I don't get into all and how it looks and all that. I just like good food. And I love Hattie B's hot chicken. And, and I, I've taken more people to Hattie B's to eat hot chicken. Justin, you're, in a, you're a Chick-fil-A evangelist. Every time I, if I ever get on Facebook, you have just eaten at Chick-fil-A. I mean, dude, you should, like, be getting a vest or something from them. <laughs> you know, you give blood and you get like how many, chart, how many gallons you've given over your lifetime. Anyway, um, and there's a barbecue place in town called Hogwoods, okay? And it's been in a restaurant location that has failed. You know, interesting how some locations, that, like things fail, fail, fail. Well, it looks like it's going to make it. And, um, but the reason why I'll talk to people at Hogwoods is because before you leave, they give you a moon pie. I don't even like moon pies. But what I love is that you order your lunch, you go and eat, and somebody is paying enough attention that before you leave, they walk over and say, I hope you enjoyed your lunch today. Here's a moon pie. I'm like, who does that? You know, they can give it to you at the beginning, but then it just looks like it's part of the $35 for, that you paid for the sandwich. That's kind of why they need to add the moon, right? But, but, I, but I, lo I love the cleverness. I love the attention to that kind of deal. And I'll tell everybody, I mean, that giving away a moon pie. I'll tell people, oh, you want barbecue? I really like this hogwood down here. Why? Because they gave me a dadgum moon pie. <laughs> I love that they pay attention to that. Evangelism isn't the problem. It becomes the subject of our evangelism. Jesus says, we mentioned rejection. He says, they rejected me. You're going to be rejected too. But what's fascinating to me is the, the amazing download that Jesus does in the book of John, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 in the Last Supper. Part of the time, he prays for the disciples. And he prays this prayer. Lord, I do not ask that you would take them out of this world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. That is an amazing prayer. He's saying, okay, re they rejected me. We should not have this estimation that somehow we won't be rejected. But listen, they're not rejecting me. They're rejecting him. That's kind of what he's telling us. And he's telling us to kind of stay, stay in the game. The most comprehensive definition of evangelism I've come across is from, David, from Dr. David Bosch in his book, Transforming Mission. It was a heart uh, a research heart of my project. He says this about defining evangelism. Evangelism involves witnessing to what God has done 
is doing and will do. In light of this, evangelism cannot be defined in terms of results or effectiveness as though evangelism has only occurred where there are converts. Rather, evangelism should be perceived in terms of its nature and mediating the good news of God's love in Christ that transforms life, proclaiming by word and action that Christ has set us free. Now here's some observations. One, he's telling us that evangelism is about God, not me. That's a good thing. I'm not promoting me. It's not dependent on me. Evangelism is about God, not me. Second is evangelism isn't result-based. It's process-based. So success is not determined by what people do in response to me, but in me responding to the call of Christ. Everybody with me? And then evangelism isn't about a religion or an ideology. It's about Jesus' love, his transforming and freeing power. And that's what I want to be a part of. The simplest definition I found, on, found for evangelism is from an international church pastor in Iraq named John J. Mack Stiles. Here's his definition. Evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. Teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. So teach implies process. It implies uh, hands-on relationship. It implies time. Um, that Christianity isn't a way of thinking. It's a way of living. In teaching is not just an information dump. Um, it is done with passion to display our own motivation um, for the life change. Um, so it's verbally active in a witness teaching. Some of you may have heard a quote that's attributed to Francis of Assisi, who began the Franciscan order of monks. And what gets quoted is that he said, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. It sounds really good. The only problem is he never said it. In fact, his whole life would have been an antithesis to this. He was known to have preached in five villages a day. What he did say, though, was that a friar's deeds should match his words. And this is where the church, individual Christians, kind of get hammered, is then when our life doesn't match our words. And I don't necessarily mean by our, our, all of our behavior sometimes. I would say sometimes even our hope, that we don't even display the hope that we would proclaim. And, and it's, in that, it's in that mismatch where the effectiveness of evangelism drops off. Here's my point. If, if it doesn't work for me, how in the world would I ever, you know, if I, if I said, look, you should go to Hogwood Barbecue because the moon pies, what a great, nice technique, but the barbecue's really bad. Right, who would, who would go? You'd go to the store and just buy a box of moon pies, right? So, so it's the behavior linking with the words it's verbally active, it matches, and it's anchored in what God does. Evangelism is anchored in who God is, what God does. And today, we live in this culture that wants to deconstruct the Bible. Okay, well, it, it, That's the word. It's, it's a deconstruction. It's a, it's a pulling apart and piecing back together. Basically, it, it's, a, it's an exercise in developing your own faith. A boutique faith with a boutique boutique. Um, set of foundational points. Recently, I saw, I saw a banner that, said, that says, God still speaks today. And I'm like, yes, he does. But it was on the backdrop of a rainbow. So here's what they were really saying. That God still speaks today, and he changed his mind about what he said in the Bible. Okay? God does still speak today, but he doesn't change what he said before. Another thing I, I've seen is that Scripture is a living, it's a, it's a living book. And I go, yes, it is. It's a living book. But the way the culture is defining that now 
is that it changes according to culture. It's living, so it changes according to culture. That's not the way Scripture def defines itself. Here's how it defines itself in, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is a living, breathing book, but because the Holy Spirit breathed on it, and it breathes on it for us, and it, listen, it's not there just to encourage, it's there to challenge, strengthen, hey, listen, and even rebuke, and that's not what anybody would want to say that they want out of Scripture. Evangelism is also not monotone. It's persuasive, and here's where um, the culture kind of really runs to runs uh, aground with this thing, um, because we see persuasion as um, salesmanship, and the culture, no, you don't. I'm not. I'm not buying. But I don't want you to see evangelism and persuasion as salesmanship. I want you to see it as passion. Passion. So when the apostle um, Paul is imprisoned and he is making the gamut of pleading his case, he comes to the place of King Agrippa. This is found in Acts chapter 26. And King Agrippa gives him the opportunity to plead his case of wise and chains and why he should be released. And what Paul does is he takes the opportunity to give his testimony, what traditionally we would say his testimony. He was witnessing to what his interaction with Christ was. And it's a pretty flamboyant testimony. King Agrippa, I was like you. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In so, at such a degree that I was out to stop this very movement I'm a part of. I'm on the way to Dis Damascus. I'm there to kill Christians. And lo and behold, this light comes out of the sky, knocks me off my horse, and I hear these words, Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it was the Lord. He tells this story in such a compelling fashion that Agrippa's response is, Saul, do you think in such a short time that you would persuade me? And he says, well, whether now or later, I just, what I just wish is that everybody, that everybody would follow this way, would follow me except for the chains I'm now wearing. He didn't go into a song and dance. There wasn't the sales routine. He was passionate about what had been done, what he had experienced, how he was changed. And that passion is what drove that testimony that even the king was saying, did you think that you were going to change me in this short amount of time? That's why I call this fresh starts and not fresh stops. That, that when we come to Christ, that's a beginning. It's not an ending. It, the, the life that he brings isn't just life at one time. He, bring, he continues to bring life. He continues to bring transform, transformation in our life. He continues to, to give us stories to tell because there are people that need to hear those stories. So don't, if you think about evangelism as, as this sales pitch, it's not, but it is passionate. It is persuasive. If you think about it just as an information dump, it's not just an information dump. People don't lack the information. This is not a it works for me, it doesn't, or it, it works for me, but it might not work for you kind of information dump. It's, it's persuasive. So, so my kind of new de definition of evangelism is this. It's a lifestyle consistent, verbally passionate delivery of who God is, what God has done, and what God is doing. Evangelism is a lifestyle consistent, verbally passionate delivery of who God is, what God has done, and what God is doing. Tell me if any of these fit you, especially since we talked about fear, fear of rejection. We have fear of rejection when I think about evangelism. How about fear we won't do it right? What about fear that we won't have all the answers? 
What about fear that we aren't the best representations of Jesus? Now, you don't have to be an English major to understand who the subject matter of all those fears were, right? Me. But here are some driving forces of evangelism that we need to consider. One, the love of God displayed in Christ is a foundational um, concept for evangelism. Two, the power of the Holy Spirit um, draws people to Jesus. So that would be not me. People's desperate need for life and freedom and the willingness to play my part are four driving forces of evangelism. And even how I wrote it up here, we're, we're, the last, we're last of the driving force. The love of Christ is a driving force. The power of the Holy Spirit is a driving force. People's need is a driving force. And then it becomes my role to play my part. And this is even where the name of our church came from, Gateway. That we would be, each of us, would be gateways for other people to find and experience who Jesus is. So in the, la- in, the, in the minutes I have left, I want to go over seven, what I consider seven foundational elements of evangelism. All right, seven foundational elements of evangelism. First one, um, you have to start with this. Sin separates and kills. Okay, here's Ephesians 4.18. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. It's Proverbs 10, 16. The wages of the righteous life, the, the wages of the righteous is life, but the earnings of the wicked are sin and death. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a primary foundational reason for evangelism. If I just believe that you and I have a difference of opinion, I, I, I actually, I like being around people that have different opinions. I, I, I like the dialogue. The only time I don't like the dialogue is when they, want to, when they want to argue. I just don't like arguing. I'm good at it, but you've got to make me mad to argue. And I don't like how I get after I get mad. So I'd rather not argue. So this is not, evangelism isn't about an argument. It's about this core conviction that where I was, if I have an honest opinion of where I was based on Scripture before Christ, I was dead in my sin and I was separated from God. And so, and so I understand that it's real for me and it's real for everyone. That becomes a foundational um, point for evangelism. If I don't, if I don't believe then that, why, why do it? Right? If I don't believe that, then why do it? But if I believe that, that becomes a motivation. Here's the second. Sight impacts reach. Sight impacts reach. A foundational understanding of sin allows me to see people like God sees them. All right? So how does God see sin? See, because if you depend on our, if you depend on our culture's definition, when you say sin, you're saying you're wrong, and, and so then that means that you must hate me, and all this other stuff. But here, here's how Jesus saw people, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Why were people drawn to Jesus? Compassion. Compassion. We, we, find, we find prostitutes drawn to Jesus. We find thieves drawn to Jesus. We find lepers drawn to Jesus. We find kids drawn to Jesus. We find failures in business drawn to Jesus. Why? His compassion. Where does his compassion come from? He saw them as harassed and helpless. 
driving foundational force of effective evangelism is to see people with compassion. To not see them in anger, not to see them as they're somehow trying to ruin your life. We see them with compassion. I know that culture says to be compassionate is then to, um, you have to then receive me uh, where I am and who I am. One of the challenges of church in the 21st century is we cannot allow culture to make all the rules, change all the rules, change what words mean and what they have traditionally meant. I can love you where you are. I can be in relationship with you where you are. When at the same time, seeing that you may be still dead and Christ brings resurrection. Do you understand that? Culture tells us that's not true. Culture is telling us that acceptance and compassion it's just got to be where I am, and you got to leave me where I am. And I will contend, from a Christian standpoint, that is not compassion. It's complicit. It's birthed out either a wrong understanding or afraid of being labeled. And if they're going to if they're going to label me wrong, let them label me that I'm compassionate. The third foundational point is that people are more ready than you realize to receive the gospel. Here's John 4. Jesus said, My food said, my food said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. The people are more ready than you realize to hear about the transforming work of Christ. This is connected to number four. I mean, that alone should help you take some steps if you realize that that there's nothing wrong with the harvest. I I heard one, one gentleman put it this way. Evangelism is a math problem. There just isn't enough people doing it. So four is commission validates mission. Commission validates mission. Evangelism isn't a personal crusade. It's not a personal crusade. It's finishing the work of Christ. He just said it's, it's his, his food is to do the will and send him and to finish his work. And then in Matthew 28, he says, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Since he's giving us a co-mission, he goes with us to do that, and that co-mission validates this mission of evangelism. Here's the fifth. Evangelism isn't self-powered. It's Holy (laughs) Spirit-empowered. You know, I told you, so I did my doctoral work around this question. Why aren't more people involved in evangelism? Why aren't they better? I have spent literally three years, I took... It was turned into four. I had to take a sabbatical when my mom got real sick. Um, But I went to a liberal Methodist university, and I had a Catholic reader of my project. Okay? And so the Catholic reader calls me one day and says, okay, I like your project, but, but there are two basic things that you haven't addressed. And I said, okay. He said, first, you talk about salvation, but you never talk about sin. I said, okay, I guess I should probably talk about sin. I mean, that's the problem. And I said, well, what do you want me to tell you about sin? He said, well, do you believe sin has caused mankind to be sick and it needed a healer? And I went, no, 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 I, I believe sin killed us and we had to be resurrected. He said, okay, you need to say that. And then he says, you're the Pentecostal, right? I said, yeah. He said, I'm the Catholic, right? Yeah. He says, you don't talk anything about the role of the Holy Spirit when it comes to someone coming to faith. I went, wow, I'm glad that my Methodist university with a Catholic adjunct professor could tell me that I needed to pay attention to the role of the Holy Spirit in evangelism. 
And here it is. The Holy Spirit is the one who draws people, convicts people, saves people. Not me. I mean, that's, boy, that's refreshing, especially for a type A driven person like myself. That my role is to play my role. And the Holy Spirit plays his role. Evangelism isn't self-powered, it's Holy Spirit empowered. He says this in Acts 1, 8, 9, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. Last word Jesus gives, he tells them they will, they will receive power to become his witnesses. Witness is a being and a doing event. It's not just a doing event. Because if, 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 you, if, you if you haven't been a witness, you can't be a witness. You with me? Witness isn't just a doing nature. It's a being nature. And the Holy Spirit transforms us and causes us to be and then empowers us to do. Here's the sixth one. People are looking for a message to believe in and a community to belong to. More than ever, this is the case. Because we're in a postmodern, deconstructive world, and everybody making up their own truth, it actually leads to more despair, not more hope. But the culture rejects what's called a meta narrative, this singular thread of story. And the singular thread of story, human history, is God through the Bible. It is why if we allow this deconstructive thought, well, God, you know, maybe he meant that, you know, in the third century, but he doesn't mean it in the 21st century. Well, then what does he mean? I mean, if that one's up for grabs, what's not up for grabs? Do, do, do you see how th this foundation starts to crack and fall apart, and then we're all just kind of piecing together whatever we want to believe about God? Instead of diving into the Word being taught in community and discovering who he really is. That, that's, where, that's where strength is. People want a message to believe in that they know it's true and it's not. Everybody, like, like uh, anytime someone has an opinion, well, of course, then it's filtered. It's what we run into with our news right now, right? That, that, I mean, if you're honest, you'd say, well, I know if I turn in this channel, I get this perspective. And if I turn into this channel, I get this perspective, right? And so if you're really after the truth, you actually are having to listen to two different things to try to cobble together what may be true because we, we, we know, just inherently we know, this is coming from this perspective. Scripture doesn't come from a perspective. Scripture doesn't take sides. He is the side. That's what, that's what gets frustrating me about politics. Everybody's trying to find sides. God is a side. So guess what? Both are wrong. Both get it wrong. And you know what? Sometimes both get it right. But they're doing it so far outside of the context of trying to follow this single meta narrative. And that's why the church can't be co opted. We have to stay on point. What's the gospel? What's the hope? It's not going to be fulfilled by whoever we place in whatever political office from school board to the president. Our hopes in Christ. There's a message people want to believe in. Do you believe in that message? If you believe in that message, then it comes out differently than this works for me, but it might not work for you. And they want a community to belong to. I believe firmly in this idea of belong to believe. That, 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 that we embrace people. We embrace them. Embracing people doesn't mean that somehow the language of the gospel gets watered down because that's not what they need. They need love expressed in truth. And that I'm not going anywhere just because we're different. I'm not going anywhere just because we think differently. I'm not going anywhere just because you look differently. I'm staying put. That's a community to belong to. When you read the end of Acts chapter 2, the amazing thing to me about Acts chapter 2 is it starts defining how this new community is surfacing, how it's coming together. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to breaking of the bread, to prayer. It says that 
when one had need, the community found a way to take care of the other person's need. And when it gets done describing this new community in a century and among a people that were community-driven, mind you, first century Judaism was a family-oriented system. And yet this new community that's formed, it ends, Acts chapter 2 ends and says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Why? Because the community was attractive. I mean, it was, this is nutso. Why would this person sell a piece of property because this person just went in foreclosure? What possibly could be the motivation for that? And and when they find out what the motivation is, they I want to be a part of that. The best compliment anybody could ever pay Gateway would say, I don't believe like you do, but I sure do like your people. We don't see this the same, but man, your people are overwhelming, overwhelmingly gracious. Message to believe in, a community to belong to. Here's the last one. Evangelism is a synergistic endeavor, a synergistic endeavor. Whenever I think of evangelism as a me thing, I always get intimidated, okay? And I've been over my course of my life, I've been able to fight through that more times than not. But when I think of we, when I think of team, it changes my outlook. So here's... Back to the we, this, the idea of being us and the Holy Spirit and the church. First, I'll talk about the Holy Spirit real quick. The role of the Holy Spirit in evangelism first is my own salvation and my ongoing transformation. That's the Holy Spirit. I yield to the Spirit, but the Spirit transforms me. Are you with me? I yield to the Spirit, but the Spirit does the transforming. So I'm not as concerned about where I am as who I am yielded myself to. All right? Second one, the Holy Spirit brings about divine appointments. The Holy Spirit puts people in our path for this very reason. He put my neighbor in my driveway for a specific purpose and reason. Then it was up to me of whether or not I was going to just swallow my pride, if you will, about our different altercations that we've had, and I was going to engage him with the compassion of Christ. And it was a real, t- it was real touch and go there for a minute. So, you know, if... I never, I'm never honest up here, am I? Third, memory, words, and persuasion. So um, I, heard in the, I heard in the congregation, well, I'm afraid I might do it wrong. Well, again, I becomes the subject. But Je- what Jesus promised the disciples about the Holy Spirit is that he would remind them of everything he ever taught them. What, what a bizarre thing to throw in there about the role of the Holy Spirit to the disciples. And he will remind you of all things that I've ever taught you. I've said stuff in conversations with people who weren't followers of Christ. That I, I left the conversation and I, I've said to myself literally out loud, I don't know where that came from. That perspective, that 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 shift of perspective that comes in those conversations, wisdom then I go, man, I wish someone would have recorded that. Where does that come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit because it is a co-mission. It's a co-mission. And then the results. Again, I grew up and the evangelism was a duty. It wasn't an invitation to what the Father's business was. It was a duty. And that always had its own baggage. And this idea that, you know, somehow I had to get to the person to actually pray, you know, and receive Jesus there. And, and that stuff's also very intimidating. But beyond that, it's just not true. You know, it, it takes an average of seven encounters with someone of faith before someone will ever receive Christ. Seven. So sometimes we're the first. The first through the wall gets bloodied. Great, great movie line from Moneyball. First one through the wall gets bloodied. So sometimes I've been the first person. Sometimes I've been the seventh person. Sometimes I haven't known the number. You usually know one and you usually know seven. It's the ones in between you don't generally know. But it's about the process and me engaging in the process. But what about the local church? How does the local church impact this? We're in partnership in this thing. You know, decades before, it was just kind of 
pastor would tell everybody, invite someone to church, invite someone to church, invite someone to church. Literally, in the first, first year of Gateway, I told people, I said, I don't want you to invite anybody to church, which is counterintuitive for a church planner, right? I said, but if you're involved in a relationship with someone who doesn't know Christ, I'd love for them to come with you. This isn't about passing out flyers saying, come to this thing. It's about being engaged in relationship. And I said, the beauty of us being in the room together, and I'm, I'm great, I'm fine with live stream, and I'm fine how people find it later, and it's archived, and, and this, is, this is a great tool. But when we're together, here's what happens. I can lend you my faith, and I can borrow, my, I can borrow faith from you. I can cry on your shoulder. I can have my shoulder cried on. I can high-five you. You can high-five me. That happens when we're in the room together. And as a church, we do this together. The more people praying for someone who doesn't know Jesus in your sphere of influence, the, ex they're, they're, um, the, the odds of them coming to Christ get exponentially increased. Your son-in-law. When names were written one Easter, or, or coming into Easter, names were written on cards for salvation. It's the best gateway store I have got. One of the best. And then a couple weeks after Easter, we're going through the cards, praying for them. And evening prayer, we divided up all the cards that had been turned in with people's names. And I got three cards. And I sat here in this seat. And I got my three cards. And I've been reading the names and praying for them. And I got to a particular name. And I turned around. And sitting in that chair was that name. Praying for a group of three names that was handed to him. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I called him my name and I said, this is your car, bro. He said, I know my wife put that in before Easter and I've prayed to receive Christ. I mean, you're talking about full circle, folks. That's good stuff. I mean, that, that is the partnership of a local. That's why I'm saying it's evangelism synergy. It's how we work together to do this. We do it together under the power of the Holy Spirit. There was some, my, my dad, just getting my dad to church. You know, dad never even came to Gateway. Dad passed away before, well, not long after Gateway launched, but. But he had already come to faith. But part of the reason why I believe he did is when I brought him to church with me in our church in Atlanta. The church in Atlanta was a large church. It was a mega church. So you can come in and leave and no one really know who you were. And so my dad was good with that. Okay. And then, but he, for some reason, he had a high level of respect for our senior pastor. And our senior pastor would always find my dad. And we're talking about we'd sit in the balcony. So it wasn't like you just immediately, but he would always find my dad before he left to speak to my father. The second was there was an older gentleman named Jack. And Jack ran all of the intramural sports at our church. And Jack, we, we sat in Jack's section. Ushers, listen to me. We sat in Jack's usher section. And Jack knew my dad. And Jack spoke to my father every single time we showed up in church. Every single time. All that was huge. How many of you had coffee today? You had coffee. Raise your hand. You had coffee today. I mean, our coffee. All right. So there was a season in church's life where I didn't want us to have coffee anymore. Matter of fact, we had coffee and donuts, and I stopped the donuts. I stopped coffee and donuts for a long time. People asked me why. I said, because we were spending more money on coffee and donuts than we were spending on mission, missions. I said, so until, some, until someone gives me a good reason to have coffee and donuts, we're just going to give the money to missions. And then one person mentioned, about a year into it, said, Pastor, it's a whole lot easier to have a conversation with somebody when you have something in your hand. And I went, It is. Next Sunday, we had coffee. Coffee now had a purpose. And you know, there's people that show up early. So that you just can't have Folgers. So there's beans bought from a Christians in another country that's trying to eke out a living. And we buy the beans from them. And they get ground here, made for you. Why? So you could have something in your hand to have a conversation with someone you don't know. But guess what? Someone has to get her early on Sunday to make coffee and have to understand that that is also part of an evangelistic, synergistic relationship. And we do this together. This is one of the four in this new season coming up with Gateway that God's calling us to do. And I want you to overcome your fears. 
and let's partner together more and more for more people to find the freedom you and I experience. Let's stand for prayer and then we're going to conclude with this worship song. Father, I thank you for the men and women in this room, the students in this room. Lord, for those that are watching online, those who will find this later in an archive. Lord, I hear, I pray that what minds and ears have heard today, Lord, is a compassionate recognition of people being lost like I was once lost. And this core conviction that Jesus came for everyone. And Lord, as a church at 1288 Lewisburg Pike, Lord, we want to play our role in seeing more people freed, more brokenness healed. And we know that we don't do this on our own, but in the power of your Holy Spirit, let it be so. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's close with with this worship.
power, the persuasion, all come from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we, we ask for your, your fresh breath, your power to rest among us, part of your body that we call Gateway. That you would draw people into our lives individually, corporately. Lord, that we can come alongside of and we can be a part of the teaching, the witnessing, and the hands-on application of your healing power. And Lord, I know that that can get messy. And Father, we just yield ourselves to you as a church. That you would open doors and open windows of relationship. And that you would provide us with courage to walk through those doors. We need you to be who you've called us to be. In this moment, we yield ourselves to you. Continue to transform us and use us, Lord, to bring someone into your transforming power as well. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. If you're a guest with us today, it's been great having you part of our worship service. We'd love to get a chance to meet you right outside those double doors under the big C. Um, after the benediction, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May it make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. You're rising up, you're laying down, you're going in and coming out, both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.